Hello, everybody. This is Dr. Abdul Kader Ashur. Today, we are going to continue our series on talks about pharmacologic management of heart failure. We started first talking about pathophysiology of heart failure. Then we talked about drugs for the management of heart failure, where we talked about main drugs used for treatment of heart failure other than enotropic drugs. So part three, guess what? It will be the enotropic drugs used for management of heart failure, which will start right now. Well, in the first part of enotropic agents and uh, management of heart failure, we will uh, talk about uh, these uh, enotropic drugs. What are these enotropic drugs used for treatment of heart failure? Then we will talk about history, structure, and the mechanism of action of cardiac glycosides. Okay, uh, before I start talking about that, I need to give some intro or a reminder or a refresher about cardiac action potential. Because uh, the, the non-cardiac cells have certain action potential, sodium uh, influx, uh, uh, potassium outflux, okay? There is no plateau, this plateau, if you remember. So let me walk you through this. So uh, uh, the cardiac action potential differs from normal uh, uh, other uh, or other cells uh, action potential by this plateau. This plateau is due to the fact that there is influx of potassium, uh, an activation of sodium channels. There is inf I'm sorry. There is uh, influx of calcium. Okay, influx of calcium and efflux of potassium. So positive in calcium. Positive out potassium, so they cancel each other, so there is no change in the voltage of the cell. So the action potential will stay almost similar for some time, some milliseconds. So this is called the plateau. This is very characteristic for the cardiac action potential. So uh, it plays an important role in coordinating the contraction of the muscle. It starts from the SA node then goes to the AV node, SA, uh, the SA node, you know, the pacemaker of the heart, then to the AV node, then bundle of his, then Purkinje fiber, which uh, activate the whole ventricular uh, myocardium. Okay, so the phases, uh, phase zero here, this is the influx of sodium, one and the three, they correspond to the inactivation of sodium channel, and uh, the opening of potassium channels where there is efflux, so positive is coming out, so negative, the, uh, so the, 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 uh, the membrane potential will go down, okay, toward the negative, because I'm taking positive charge out. Uh, so, and the plateau, as we said, is due to the uh, opening of voltage-gated calcium channels, okay, so calcium in, along with potassium out, they can see each other. Okay, now uh, we will talk about this part only, okay, the uh, enotropic drugs, okay, and treatment of heart failure. Heart failure is associated with decreased cardiac output, so why don't we deal with that? This is kind of a unique from the other classes of drugs. We talked about them in the previous video. So uh, this will include like digoxin, melrinone, and then beta agonist, which we will be, uh, which we'll discuss right now. So these positive enotropic drugs are cardiac glycosides, phosphodiesterase inhibitors, specifically PDE3, and then uh, beta agonists. Today we'll talk only about the cardiac glycosides. We'll finish even the cardiac glycosides in the next video. Okay, so what's, uh, what's enotropic agent or uh, cardiotonic? Okay, it's an agent that enhances the cardiac muscle contractility. Positive enotropic, negative enotropic, decrease cardiac contractility or inhibit. Positive enotropic enhance cardiac contractility. If enhanced cardiac contractility, there is good contraction, so there is good stroke volume, there is better or great uh, cardiac output. Uh, these classes of drugs, the three classes we talked about, although they work by different mechanisms, but all of them increase cytoplasmic calcium concentration, which can enhance the contraction of the myocardial cells. The first one that has been discovered uh, was digoxin from the cardiac glycoside. Or let me uh, say it again, it's cardiac glycoside has been uh, discovered by this guy Withering in uh, 1775, okay? 
These include digoxin, digitoxin, oabin, all of these are called cardiac, see here, cardiac glycosides, okay? Uh, they come from the fox globe, uh, digitalis species, and related plants, okay? This is a kind of a quotation from, uh, or quote, I'm sorry, quote from uh, Withering saying it has a power over the motion of the heart to a degree yet unobserved in other, in, in other medicine. So it has a fabulous effect on the heart. It could be used for treatment of cardiac dropsy. Cardiac dropsy uh, it means uh, like edema or congestion or congestive heart failure. So this is the structure of cardiac glycosides. It contains these three moieties: sugar, glycosides. Generally speaking, glyco means there is a sugar. Okay, usually sugar and aglycone. These are the components of glycoside. Generally speaking, okay. Uh, so sugar. Okay, uh, connected to a steroid. This is a steroid nucleus, as you know, right? This is these four rings is a steroid nucleus. Okay, and a lactone ring. This is five, this five membered ring is called lactone ring. Lactone ring is very essential for the activity. Okay, uh, and the other uh, parts, the sugar and aglycone, are important for the pharmacokinetics and for to determine the potency of one cardiac glycoside versus other you know sugar increases the water solubility uh, this steroid is lipophilic so it will enhance lipid solubility and both of these will <coughs> sorry will affect the pharmacokinetic parameters as well as the potency of these cardiac glycoside they are the, the, the most important cardiac glycoside is digoxin. Okay, it is the only cardiac glycoside that's uh, used in the United States of America. Okay, pharmacokinetics. Digoxin is about 65 to 80 percent absorbed after oral administration, which is good. Widely distributed to tissues, including even the central nervous system, it can pass through the central nervous system. You can expect this steroid nucleus will help because it's lipophilic. Uh, it can help in the passage through the blood brain barrier. Uh, it's not extensively metabolized. Uh, human, about two thirds are excreted uh, uh, unchanged by the kidney. And this excretion is proportional to the renal clearance, which is proportional to the renal function. The more renal clearance, the more, the better the renal function. Okay, and the half life, generally speaking, see how the half life is 36 to 40 hours. Don't call it telling one. The secret. Okay, so it's 36 to 40 hours, the half life. Okay, this is this is kind of uh, good. Okay, it has good long duration of action, but as you see, it will participate in the narrow therapeutic index of this drug. Okay. Then uh, pharmacodynamics. Pharmacodynamics you not know, deals with pharmacokinetics deals with absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion. Pharmacodynamics deals with the mechanism of action, the action, the effect, the side effects of the drug. It has multiple cardiovascular effects with both therapeutic, which we are using this drug for, but unfortunately, so many side effects. It has many side effects on uh, CNS and uh, uh, GIT. Okay, uh, it works by inhibition of sodium potassium ATPase, by inhibition of sodium potassium pump. How? It's here, okay. So this is the kind of uh, graph or diagram showing the mechanism of action of uh, uh, digitalis on uh, cardiomyocyte. This is the cell membrane, contains the sodium potassium pump. Okay, remember there is a sodium potassium pump here, and there is a calcium sodium or sodium calcium exchanger. Okay, this is passive, this is active. Okay, this needs ATP. This just inhibits uh, sodium potassium exchange by sodium potassium ATPase. As you know, at the end of the action potential, potassium will be the main extracellular ion, sodium will be the main intracellular ion, which is opposite to what the cell needs. The cell needs potassium to be inside, right? mainly and sodium to be outside so it will say to them guys could you please go back to your uh, original places please okay so they this cannot be done just by ordering it's by pump by energy okay so this sodium potassium pump usually exchange potassium okay with sodium okay so this digitalis inhibit this potassium pump which means that potassium will stay outside 
and sodium will stay inside. Okay, I'm slowing down so you can concentrate. This is very important. Usually this pump will take sodium out. If you inhibit this pump by digitalis or by digoxin or being digitoxin, whatever, this sodium will stay out, uh, uh, inside, right? Okay, okay, keep this in mind. Okay, then there is a sodium calcium exchanger, which exchange sodium from the extracellular space into the intracellular uh, of the cytoplasm and calcium from the cytoplasm into the extracellular space, okay? Uh, now, let me go back. What happened after I inhibited the sodium potassium pump or sodium potassium ATP? More sodium here, right? So sodium is here more, right? More, 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 more. So this will uh, inhibit the uh, concentration gradient of sodium because sodium now is high here. So sodium can't get, go in and in turn, calcium will not go out. So more calcium inside, okay? So this calcium uh, or decreased extrusion of calcium will later will uh, bind to the rhinodine receptors of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. This, then there is a release of calcium which will facilitate the sliding of actin over myosin and muscle contraction will occur, okay? This is just a simple mechanism of the, of the action of digoxin on the myocardial sac. Okay, that's it for now. And uh, I'll see you in the second part where we will talk about, continue our talk about digitalis and then the, the other two classes, uh, the crystal series inhibitors and the beta agonists. Okay, until then, I wish you a good luck and have a wonderful day.